morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to St. John's Westminster Union Church. Whether you're here in person or visiting with us online, we welcome you here. I have some announcements. Uh, the annual church picnic is next Sunday, September 22nd, after the church service. We're planning a potluck. We'll be grilling hot dogs, mats, and brats. Drinks will be provided. If you have not done so already, please sign up on the sheet on the snack table in the narthex to let us know how many plan to attend and the side dish or dessert which you will be bringing. The first Sunday in October, World Communion Sunday, we will be receiving our neighbors in need and the peace and global witness offerings of our denominations. That offering will be divided equally between the denominations, as is our practice. See the bulletin insert for more information. Envelopes are in the pews and also on the back table. Also, mark your calendars for Trunk or Treat. It will be held here in the parking lot on Thursday, October 24th, from 6.30 to 7.30. It is always a fun time. Decorate your cars, get the candy ready. For more information, see the article in the live, and of course, there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex. Rhonda Courtright will be taking blood pressures today after worship, as today is the third Sunday of the month. We are still looking for volunteers for Children's Church. If you are interested in teaching or being a helper, please sign up on the sheet on the snack table in the narthex. Thank you for your continuing generous support of For His Glory Food Pantry. Um, what are we collecting for September? Chili and, Chili and macaroni and cheese. Um, so bring them in, leave them on the table in the back. Thank you. Are there any other announcements I've forgotten? That was a long list. No? Okay. All right. Would you please join me in the call to worship? The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares language. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, in their words to the end of the world. confession, please. God of mercy, we confess that we are often quick to speak and slow to think. We are vocal about our own desires, 
but remain embarrassingly silent about our faith. Help us to take charge of our words so that we might build others up instead of spreading hate. Taking up our cross, we put our faith in the hope of your resurrection, anxiously awaiting time when peace will flourish throughout the earth. Amen. The prophet Isaiah tells us that convictions from others are not the final word. Rather, the highest judge is God, and all authority lies with him. Do not fear the threats of the world, for through the sacrifice made by Christ Jesus, our sins have been forgiven, and we have been granted eternal life. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson today is from Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Hear God's word as I share it with you. Jesus went on with his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
your advice. Amen. Amen. Please join me for our epistle reading, which comes from the book of James, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes, and anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder whenever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and is set itself on fire by hell. For every species of bird and beast, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people, made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1979, the British prog rock band Supertramp released what would become their best-selling album, Breakfast in America. And if you were around then, you may recall the very famous cover art that featured the New York City skyline, along with the Twin Towers, built up, made out of various breakfast dishes, and the Statue of Liberty, in a way, a woman, a waitress, standing at the front holding a glass of orange juice. Now, this album had some of their best songs on it, in my opinion, including one that became their best charting single, The Logical Song. As someone who has always tried to avoid being labeled into one particular category, I've long been influenced by one line in this song in particular. Watch what you say or they'll be calling you a radical, a liberal, fanatical, criminal. I interpret this line as saying that our words matter more than we might think. But it also raises questions, just as our scripture reading does today. When should we speak? And when we do, what is it that we should say? Let us pray. Gracious God, you have placed us on this earth to bear witness to your power and glory. Guard our lips so that we may always be good representatives of your kingdom. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my rock and redeemer. Amen. You have probably seen in the news unfolding over the past few weeks, back in my old state of Virginia, that a boar's head meatpacking plant has been shut down due to a listeria outbreak. And it always seems incredible to me that something so tiny, so microscopic as a, as a virus or a bacteria or any other particle has the potential to unleash such major negative effects. It's not even visible to the blind eye. You have to use microscopes to see it. But things like these are what cause diseases like the Black Plague and the Spanish Flu to spread across the world and decimate populations. Now, I highly doubt that the author of James was familiar with microbiology. But he was aware that even the smallest things can have huge and sometimes negative impacts. 
In our reading this morning, he notes that a rudder, which as a former sailor myself, I can tell you that it is a very small component at the stern or the end of the ship, but that is what directs the entire ship's course. He also points out that if a horse won't move, a small treat might be able to do the trick. According to James, the tongue is no different. It's small, it may not seem very impactful, but I'd say out of all of our organs, it probably has the greatest impact. The Jewish author Philo, who predates James, similarly compared the power of a helmsman or charioteer to the power that our consciences have over our actions. James's writing suggests that he was well read not only in the works of philosophers like Philo, but also in the wisdom literature, books like Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Our call to worship this morning, taken from Psalm 19, is one example of how these wisdom books evoke the power of speech. In this case, the psalmist proclaims that the glory of God can be shared even without words, a reminder to us that silence can often be enough to convey a message. And one thing I've had to learn in my journey to becoming a pastor has been to embrace the holy silence that can arise, especially during moments of pastoral care. Sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all, but leaving space for somebody else to speak. Other times, to avoid adding fuel to a fire, as you might say, we need to remain silent so that we don't exacerbate conflict. But silence is not always the answer. As James writes, our mouths have the potential to be a blessing. This happens when we respond to people who come to us for help, when we offer words of comfort to those who are struggling, when we sing hymns, when we say prayers, when we share in the liturgy on Sunday morning, when we share the good news of Christ with those around us. Also, when we witness something that is cruel, something that is unjust, when we see bullying or unrighteous behavior, we have a duty to speak up. I'll say it once, I'll say it again, this is easier said than done. James warns us that we who teach will face stricter judgment. And when it comes to judgment from our fellow man, this is undeniably true. All one has to do is ask pastors like Desmond Tutu, William Barber II, Martin Luther King Jr., who face imprisonment for what they taught and continue to teach today. In our gospel reading, we see that Christ himself understands the power of the tongue and the risks that the rumor mill can pose. He warns Peter not to tell others that he is the Messiah, a word which at this time would have been associated with a, not with a savior, but with a revolutionary leader, someone who would use their might to overthrow Rome. Jesus, determined to live out his mission with peace instead of violence, did not want rumors spreading that he was that kind of Messiah, particularly if it would attract unwanted attention from Roman authorities. Regardless, as we all know, his teachings would eventually lead to his crucifixion. But while our words can be used for good, they can also be a curse, as James says. We slander others to further our own agendas, spread gossip because it amuses us. We insult people because it, we think it boosts our own self-esteem. And we take the Lord's name in vain because we've come to believe that God caters to us and not the other way around. Conspiracy theories are everywhere, no longer on those magazines in the checkout lines in the grocery store or on the most fringe of fringe websites, but all across the media spectrum. As Dr. Mark Douglas, who is an ethics professor at Columbia Theological Seminary in Georgia writes, error, miscommunication, deception, slander, and libel have become so common that we expect them from reputable sources and all but insist on them from disreputable ones. Now, unfortunately, the church has not been blameless in this issue. For centuries, pastors and priests from pulpits just like this one, had disseminated misinformation to further their own agendas. Those in leadership can wield a great deal of power and have the potential to cause great harm. 
as we've seen through many cases of pastoral misconduct, of clerical abuse, and of nonprofit embezzlement. In the most extreme of cases, lives can be lost, even hundreds at a time. Those of you who remember when Breakfast in America came out will undoubtedly remember just a year earlier when 900 people were killed in Jonestown, Guyana. Again, we heed James's warning. We who teach will face stricter judgment. And I believe that leaders who deliberately lead their flocks into bad theology, theologies of hatred and abuse and even death, will be judged more harshly by God. But those of you who are not pastors are not free from this responsibility. Because at some point or another, we all fill the role of leaders in our church, in our schools, our community, in our own families. And we do not want Jesus' statement that, for we all make mistakes to come off as an excuse to write off our missteps as being blameless. Instead, it's a call to work on becoming more mature with our words and actions, to take the time to think before we speak, to take the time before we send an email, to take the time to fact check before we post on social media. Saying, writing, or sharing something in anger can have a snowball effect. Something small will eventually become impossible to control. It shouldn't be in our great nation that theologies of hate, the messages of hate, can, spend, can spread so freely. While we give thanks very much for our First Amendment rights to say and worship as we like, we also pray that we can all be more cautious about the things we say. It should be unfair that people should be scared for their lives on some days. It's not fair that bomb threats should cause schools and civic buildings up in Springfield to close down due to rumors. Everything we say has an impact. Everything we say, whether we like it or not. And so I would like to close with the words of the Reverend Arva Martin, who was the pastor of the now defunct Walnut Hills Methodist Church on the east side of Cincinnati. And during World War II, when powerful orators like Hitler and Mussolini had rallied their nations to support authoritarian regimes and invasions of foreign countries. I believe it eminently worthwhile, he said, to contend for righteousness, justice, and truth in the world, and that heaven will reward those who thus take their stand. I am so thoroughly convinced that the presence of the ever-living God in the affairs of men that I refuse to become panic-stricken when the sins and selfish ambitions of the usurpers of authority bring about destructive wars and international chaos. So sure am I of the life eternal that even death is robbed of its sting, and I go forward with courage undaunted. Righteousness, justice, and truth these are what must be reflected in our words. We have a duty to treat all who we encounter with kindness, even if they come from different backgrounds or hold different political beliefs. The church has a duty to spread Christ's message in a way that transcends all divisions, a mission of reverent thoughts, of reverent actions, and reverent words. A mission that begins right here at home, right here with us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I invite you to please stand and join me in our reading from the Heidelberg Catechism, one of the oldest creeds of faith in both the United Church of Christ and the German Reformed tradition. We believe that God has revealed himself in his word as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
We believe that we must never give false testimony against anyone, twist anyone's words, gossip, slander, or join in condemning anyone rashly without a hearing. Rather, in court and everywhere else, we should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. These are the very devices the devil uses, and they would call down on us God's intense wrath. We should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it. And we should do what we can to guard and advance our neighbors' good names. seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, you call your church to witness that in Christ we are reconciled to you. Help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may turn to you. We pray for our church leaders and staff, for our choir members and all of our volunteers, both present and past. We particularly remember the lives and legacies of the Reverends Susan Duker and Henry Marksbury, who tirelessly and selfishly dedicated their energies to caring for both this congregation and others around the Cincinnati area. Bestow comfort upon their families, friends, and all those who knew and loved them. We give thanks for our denomination's support of theological education. Be with our seminary's faculties and staff as they educate the next generation of ministers tasked with leading your church in the decades to come. This week, we remember the horrific attacks on our nation 23 years ago. May we never forget the death and destruction of that day and remember the consequences that radical ideologies can bring about. Watch over our police, our firefighters, our EMTs, our military, and all others who risk their lives every day to ensure that we can keep ours. We give thanks for this great nation, for the freedoms we have in it, and pray that these freedoms can be shared by all people across the earth. We remember those who cannot be with us today due to health or energy, to injury or struggles known only to you, Lord. May they always feel the love and fellowship that St. John's Westminster has to offer, even from afar. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, 
for those who are approaching the time of transition. We pray that you will bring comfort and remove all pain from all of those as they prepare to cross the veil. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you read my column in the church newsletter this week, and if you didn't, that's okay, I'll explain it to you now, you know that today is Theological Education Day. Churches worldwide are facing a shortage of well-trained clergy. And both the Presbyterian Church USA and the United Church of Christ are working to remedy this by helping to offset the cost of theological education. This is not possible without the financial support of individual congregations like yours. And I'll tell you right now that I would not be standing in front of you all today if it wasn't for the many donations churches across the country and our denominations have given. So with that in mind, I invite us to reflect on all that we give thanks for and return to God our signs of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Triune God, all our help comes from you and you alone. All the treasures of the world combined would not equal the blessings you have given us. We nonetheless bring these offerings before you, praying that your spirit will direct us as to how they should be used. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stay just for a few seconds right after the post food for a special announcement, but now I offer the benediction. As you disperse and as we go our separate ways, let us do so with the name of the Lord always on our tongues. Take up your cross and lift it high, proudly proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to all whom you encounter. And may the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you 
until we meet again. Amen. today or if it